And with that all, uh, this, this session is being co-hosted with the Center for International Child Health, and I'm going to pass the floor to my co-host, Jessica, to take things from here. All right. Thanks, Beth. Okay, so before we before we get started, I just want to respectfully acknowledge that I'm calling in today from the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. And so to start us off today, I'm just going to give a quick introduction to the Pediatric Sepsis Data Collab and the Data Champions Project, which led to the development of this workshop series. My name is Jessica Tron. I'm the project coordinator for the Data Collab. Um, and we're a data, a global data sharing network for collaboration to address pediatric sepsis mortality and morbidity. Our aim is to facilitate partnerships to develop and validate data collection and share tools for quality improvement in health facilities worldwide. And so we were founded through a partnership between the Center for International Child Health at BC Children's, as well as the World Federation of Pediatric Intensive and Critical Care Societies, also known as WIFPICS. And so as a data sharing network, we use Borealis, the Canadian Dataverse repository to share data and other resources among our members. And anybody who's interested in joining our network is welcome to do so. You just need to complete a short membership application available on our website, which I have the link on your screens now, or you can scan the, the QR code. And so our network currently extends to members from 48 different countries across six continents. And in addition to receiving access to our Dataverse, members also receive mentorship and networking opportunities. So we're currently hosting um, this Data Champions pilot project supported by the Digital Research Alliance of Canada. And our project is a Canadian open data access initiative, which aims to advance open data sharing um, among the clinical research community in particular. And so we're, we're quite motivated to do this project because there's been fairly widespread movement towards open data. However, many academic institutions across Canada have been fairly slow to adopt data sharing policies um, that are specific to clinical research um, and policies that meet the increasing open data requirements that are being set by publishers and funders, including the Canadian tri-agencies. And so in addition to this, we're also seeing that there's um, limited education and training available to the health research community on how best to prepare, store, and share sensitive clinical data. So we're now collaborating with the digital health research team at BCCHR to develop and deliver this series to improve open data knowledge, knowledge awareness, and skills among the health research community. And our workshop today is the second of the series. Our first workshop was held um, this past November, where our speakers oriented us on the world of open data. So we had Eugene Barsky, a research data librarian at UBC, who presented on the new Tri-Agencies Research Data Management Policy. And we also had Brittany Schister, who's the Director of Research Integration and Innovation at PHSA Research and Academic Services, who presented on ethics and practical considerations of open data sharing. And as Beth mentioned earlier, um, this recording is available for on-demand viewing um, on the WHRI's Digital Learning Corner. And I have the link up um, to that video in the slides now. And so today's speakers are going to present some case studies on open data sharing. And first up, we have Dr. Shrin Murthy, who's an investigator at BC Children. And Shrin's going to present on his experience with sharing quantitative data during the COVID-19 pandemic. And Shrin will be followed by Maggie Wu Kinshella, who's a research coordinator with UBC's Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. And Maggie's going to present on her experience with sharing qualitative data from the Integrating a Neonatal Healthcare Package for Malawi Project. And so depending on time, we'll open up the floor for Q&A at the end of each presentation. And if we're running a little bit short on time, we'll just hold for Q&A until the very end. And so with that, I will pass it over to Shrin. Okay, um, I assume folks can see my screen. Um, and thanks Beth and thanks Jessica for those introductions. I'm looking forward to seeing what Maggie has to say also. Um, and I want this to sort of be um, 
informal and hopefully this engenders questions um, so that we can sort of troubleshoot all of the issues that um, come with open data sharing. I think we all love the principles, or at least hopefully we all love the principles of open data sharing, um, but the practicalities of it, um, and I'll speak from the perspective of a researcher um, who wants to do open data sharing, who loves open data sharing, but acknowledges that um, not everyone around you necessarily has the same perspective. Um, so we'll start with sort of some case examples um, and I'll sort of reframe it in the context of COVID because um, that's been sort of my research focus for the past couple of years um, and trying to sort of push the agenda of open data sharing. Also acknowledging it really highlighted the needs of open data. So we'll talk about clinical data sharing, particularly during a health emergency. I always want to start when we talk about sharing clinical data is the why and really trying to hammer home some clear reasoning as to what we're trying to achieve when we're sharing clinical data. And I'm going to argue that data for the sake of data isn't necessarily great. It's important that there's a why attached to all of these things because the work attached and the important privacy and other implications of sharing clinical data um, need to be thought about almost always. And I'll distinguish this from health emergency related data as it relates to, to pathogen data uh, and public health data. I'm going to take pathogen data, say like the sequence of SARS-CoV-2 for example, or variant information or what have you, um, is crucial for biomedical innovation and crucial sharing for folks to work with samples in their respective jurisdictions. And public health data is crucial for, for political transparency and policy making therein. Clinical data is, I'm going to argue, is distinct from those and comes with its own sort of sets of complexities and ideas. And I, I just put some listing of reasons. So back to that why question for sharing clinical data. Um, and obviously there are more than this, this isn't exclusive. And I just sort of threw these um, on a slide deck yesterday. Um, a couple of them are asterisks and we'll talk about why they're asterisks. The first third party reproducibility. I think we all acknowledge the importance of reproducible science, specifically as it relates to clinical research and clinical questions. Um, unfortunately, there are bad faith actors out there or maybe incompetent actors out there who need to have um, reproducible data sets um, available to that so that we can make policy based on our clinical research data sets more appropriately. There's the combining with other data sets. I have a small clinical data set. You have a small clinical data set. Together, we have a bigger clinical data set. And so we can do various meta approaches or big data approaches. And the importance of sharing individual patient data, depending on the clinical question at hand, um, is, is crucial. Regulatory purposes, I think our regulators always want individual patient data for making regulatory decisions for novel products, whether it's for initial approval or for a post-marketing evaluation or what have you. And so having that data be present for um, those policymakers to investigate any safety signals or what have you is, is going to be important. And also I think fundamentally building collaborations and trust across the research community, but also with the public. And I think something that we've struggled with in the clinical research world, especially over these past three years, is maintaining that public trust. And the quote is, sunshine always builds trust or something along those lines, I'm paraphrasing. Um, but it's always nice to shine lights on problems and then um, build that transparency and build that trust through that transparency. And so I'd argue that last one is probably the most important one, more so than any sort of specific scientific question. The asterisk ones are there partially because in the absence of bad faith, or in the absence of say financial interests, we probably wouldn't need those things. If everyone did great protocols and if everyone shared their data with their regulators and so on, then 
it would probably not be required to have new policies for sharing. Um, unfortunately, that's not true. And so to maintain that trust and to maintain that reproducibility, we probably need policies to implement open data in clinical data spaces. I'll also make a point, and I always like to make this point when talking about open data, is that it's not equitable data. Um, the number of times I've put open data sets and shared open data, and the first 20, I'm exaggerating maybe, but the first like, large number of people or groups who have asked for access to that data have been, say, researchers from Harvard or Hopkins or other places where um, they just have people who are willing to use the data and have the skill sets to use the data, um, while, say, necessarily those aren't the individuals we want necessarily if the hope is to build collaborations and build trust. And so just making a data set open does not necessarily make it equitable. Um, it's partially there, but I think other policy maneuvers are important to achieve true equity with data stewardship. Um, more of an aside point, not necessarily relevant, but I think it's an important idea. So how? How do we get to share open data? I'm going to use a couple of case experiences over the course of this pandemic. Um, I've been involved or led various projects. One of them is a multinational clinical trial with a variety of data stewards. And so a data steward in Canada, a data steward in the UK, a data steward in India, for example, and other places as well. I've been involved with clinical trials with one data steward, one data steward in, in Canada with one clinical trial sponsor. And I've been involved with um, a multinational observational data set. And each of them presents their own complexities and their own sort of ideas as to how we get data from A to open. So how? Um, so the first thing we think about, and I think about, is who are your stakeholders and who is actually invested in this data being open? And what we mean by open is something we'll get to in the next couple of slides. And so your list of stakeholders is probably large. It's your researchers. It's the people who are actually generating that data, um, including a large collaborative team because that impacts the timing of the openness. Because one, one might argue, why am I participating in this research project, for example, if I don't have access to the data set and the folks from Harvard or Hopkins are just gonna swoop in and do the analysis when my grad student can't do it in as quick a time. Um, and so that argument needs to be thought about carefully when you think about how and when you make your data set open. Your funders. and so. so Different funders will have different policies in place for open data sharing. I will say that most funders, especially national funders, haven't gotten to the place yet where this is mandated. There's lots of open access publication policy, and there's lots of sort of vague statements that you can put on your grants and proposals that say you'll make your data open, but there's no actual mandate from funders like CIHR yet, and that's something we can continue to advocate for. Your ethics boards. Um, the ethics boards, and often with these multinational, multi-jurisdictional studies, will have multiple ethics boards and multiple standards with which um, data can and should be shared. And so thinking about that upfront and where those contextual differences may lie across different ethics boards, I wish all ethics boards approach this problem the same way, but they do not. Um, and so it's something that needs to be um, thought about upfront. Your study sponsor. Um, your study sponsor meaning the legal entity that's responsible for the delivery of the study. And sometimes that's an individual, like say myself as a researcher, and sometimes that's an institution, um, say UBC or a drug company if they're doing the study or what have you. And so legally they're the ones who are responsible for the integrity of the data set. Um, and if there's financial implications or insurance related implications, they are sort of the, on the hook for all of those issues. And so something that needs to be thought about from a legal perspective. And then fundamentally, the most important stakeholder is that study participant, the individual who um, has went through the process of being involved and consented in some cases um, to be involved in the study and what they know about whether their data is being shared and what they feel about that. While policymakers want data to be shared, every individual is different under policy and they may have different perspectives along those lines. So how? 
And I think it, the first point is in the how is language upfront in the consent forms. And I think previous, and Brittany probably spoke to this at our last, at your last session, um, the language upfront in the consent form needs to be very carefully worded. While I'll always acknowledge that consent forms are not legal documents per se, and they need to be able to explain what's going to happen in your research study very clearly to patients and not necessarily in legalese. Patients do need to know, or participants need, do need to know what's going to happen to that data going forward and how they will be protected from a privacy perspective. Um, if it's a rare disease, for example, and they're the one patient in British Columbia with it, and then you share that data and say that this patient um, had X, Y, and Z, um, and it was easily identifiable is a very different consent conversation for data sharing compared to every single patient in the province being participating in a study and no possibility for identification. And so these sort of thought processes about language up front in a consent form as to what and the why of data sharing needs to be integrated. And hopefully there are examples that you've seen. I'm happy to share other examples. Um, and I'm sure Brittany has shared them with the previous conversation here. How again is a, a process for anonymization. And so in all of our data sets, we often will have, and this is quantitative data, um, we'll often have de-identified data, and that's readily usually accessible in various um, ways. Anonymized data is typically a, a step above and requires a certain process to make sure it's as anonymous as possible. And while many folks have may have expertise in this, it may not be adequate expertise. And so making sure you've thought about what your process is for full anonymization if you're hoping to make your data open. And then a mechanism to share it. Um, just me having a data set on my desktop or a virtual drive or a server is not necessarily open. How do I get it to an open place? And who can access it at that open place? And obviously there are many, many different ways that this can happen. Um, and we'll talk about some of that right now. First, I wanna sort of go through what we're sort of required to do at various levels. And this is the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors. And they've put together um, various options that clinical trials specifically can do um, for data sharing and data sharing statements within manuscripts. Um, and there's various options. I just listed two of the options that they present, but like mandatory that at least every paper comes with a data sharing statement, whether that's a legal document, no. Whether people actually do what they say in those statements, no one knows. Um, but it's something that every paper needs to have. And there's various things you can share all individual patient data, that's what IPD stands for, or all IPD that relates to results, for example. You can share all of your code, which would be ideal, or just your protocol and your statistical analysis plan. You can share it immediately. You can say you're gonna share it at some later time point to be specified later. You can say it's completely open. You can say after some methodologic approval and say if it's a specific study question, you can give the specific variables related to that study question that someone wants to ask with your data set. You can do a what type of analysis, anything, or a specific proposal. Um, you can have a pre-specified portal that you just dump your data set onto and everyone accesses, or you can have specific data access agreements between your institution and their institution after a data request is approved. And so there's various different approaches. Um, a lot will depend on what the study data set is and what your willingness is to sort of share it based on all of those other considerations and what your stakeholders may say. So with COVID-19, with a multinational clinical trial, with a variety of data stewards, making the data open and completely open on a sort of a third-party portal, like a, a Vivli or something along those lines was found to be very, very challenging. Um, with different national priorities and different ethics boards with different consent form language based on local requirements and so on, um, we found this to be exceptionally difficult to operationalize. And so we've proceeded for this clinical trial more in an option two type approach. Namely, if you have a specific study question, um, we can sort of share that data individually with you um, and make it sort of available so that you can reproduce results or meta-analyze results or what have you. 
um, acknowledging that there are some sort of not political, but um, contextual issues that eventually and inevitably emerge um, when you're invoking different stakeholders across different parts of the world with different ethics oversight requirements and different legal requirements. A national clinical trial in Canada, for example, with one data steward becomes much more straightforward and much more sort of um, not cookie cutter, but more to more boilerplate. Think about how data can be shared. Um, but you need to ask yourself very specific questions. One, do you have consent to share data in the way that you are hoping to share it? And so if you screwed up your consent form when you wrote it four years ago, and now you want to share data in a certain way, not screwed up, but wrote it in an odd way, um, then you won't be able to share the data that you want um, because unless you want to go back to each individual participant who participated, you're not going to be able to do what you need to do. So these need to be thought about upfront. Do you have funding? A lot of times, if you want to share your data with a lot of these portals, it'll cost some money um, to get it there unless they're like one of those uh, well-established um, funded ones that will pay for all of the processes to be put into place? Do you have funding to share data in this way? Do you have the time to clean and label your data in the appropriate way? I think always, whenever you think about sharing data, a clean data set, a locked data set, obviously, um, and making sure that it's as clean and searchable as possible. And whether you want to do that, whether you have the energy um, in your team to actually go through that process or not means that you have to be committed to open data sharing. And hopefully you work together with the portal that you're working with to make sure that it's um, done. Does the REB, once again, we'll go back to the consent form language, approve of data sharing in this way? And then finally, are there any specific considerations re vulnerable populations or re-identification? I think in, in Canada and different parts of the world, different communities have different perspectives on data stewardship and data ownership. Um, and ensuring that um, you've thought about this upfront, whether it's say indigenous communities or communities that are otherwise marginalized, um, there needs to be clear thought processes upfront at the beginning when you're writing your protocol and you're writing your consent form as to how that's going to be approached and how open data and sharing can be integrated. No cookie cutter answer that I'm giving you here. Um, this needs to be sort of a, a case by case type approach. Also some sort of considerations, the importance of a good data dictionary. And I think folks who do these things frequently do this well, um, but thinking about it um, and making sure your data is searchable, making sure the metadata catalog is appropriate and your data dictionary can be used by others in a clear way. Understanding various data usage licensing and particularly intellectual property. And this is where it gets kind of confusing. Um, because intellectual property is something that we don't always think about in the clinical research space. Um, and it's something our sponsors and institutions always think about. Um, and so we need to sort of reflect on who uses the data and what they can use it for. In a perfect world, no one would care and we would share everything. But unfortunately, it's not that perfect world and our institutions really care deeply about intellectual property and its ownership therein. And the importance of knowing where to share things. And this goes back to the different portals that are out there and Dataverse and other things are, are great sources, um, or great resources, sorry, depending on the type of data and the community you're really trying to reach. Also, we have a multinational observational data set. And the difference is, see, this is a global thing that's uh, sort of um, been ca capturing data for COVID-19 hospitalized patients. And we have uh, almost a million patient records right now. I think partially the complexity and the reason I bring it up is that it is a waived consent routinely collected data set for clinical data. And so we have all of these data records collected without consent of routinely collected data. And we sort of struggle with how and best to share that clinical data in an open way um, while still being respectful of the participants and respectful of other researchers and the reproducibility therein. And it's not necessarily a straightforward process, just making it readily available to ev for everyone in the world to access. When we don't have necessarily consent from each of the participants, even those routinely collected, even those fully anonymized and so on, um, it needs to be sort of carefully put out there. Um, 
And so what we've done is set up data access committees that are globally representative for curated access based on methodologic approaches with a refined metadata catalog to make sure it's nicely searchable and then set up that process for data requests, common portal for scientific questions, making sure that collaborators feel appropriately engaged throughout the process to make sure that um, scientific rigor is maintained. Is it open data? No. Um, is it open-ish data? Perhaps. Um, and so there's always a spectrum of approaches there. So that goes back to the why share clinical data approach and making sure that the clinical data you have um, is answering the clinical questions that are out there and how you can sort of better achieve that. Um, remember your stakeholders and the benefits of sharing IPD itself, individual patient data. Because a lot of times you can answer a lot of clinical questions just with um, aggregate data that's readily available and has no risk of privacy or DA identification. And so really emphasizing the need for um, asking a specific question um, and why you need individual patient data. And partially that's to build collaborations and trust and thinking about your list of stakeholders. Um, a picture of sharing, sharing is good. Um, that's my email address. Happy to answer questions now or later. I apologize, Maggie, I may have cut into your time. Thanks, Ren. That was excellent. Um, such a uh, wealth of information uh, based off your experience. That was really great. Um, I think just in the interest of time, we'll maybe pass over to uh, Maggie and then we'll open up the floor for Q&A after Maggie's presentation. Okay, let me see if I can get this right. <laughs> okay, we were trying to do this earlier. Are you able to just see my slides? You're good, Maggie. Okay, that sounds great. Okay, thank you um, so much for having me here. And um, it was it's really great to go after Shrin because I feel like he's actually talked a lot about um, a, a bunch of the different processes um, and with a lot of experience. So um, I'm gonna share a little bit from our experience which uh, with the open data, with the Integrating a Neonatal Healthcare Project in Malawi. Um, so I just wanted to quickly um, acknowledge um, that I feel very privileged to live, work, and play from the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations, um, and presenting from the Research Institute today. And I was the research coordinator for this project, so I'm really presenting this on behalf of the Imcha Malawi UBC team, and in particular, I want to acknowledge the principal investigators and co-investigators listed on this page. This is a pre-pandemic picture, so it's been a little while. <laughs> um, and just as an outline of what I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to give a little bit of background on the INCHA project so you have a little idea on the data that we're sharing. Um, talk about from our perspective, what were some of the uh, benefits of open data sharing? Um, being part of the IDRC Open Data Research Initiative, and then the process of making our data open. So talking about a little bit about data management plan, preparing our data sets, um, depositing in an open data repository, um, writing up a data descriptor article um, to make it more searchable, and then finally our lessons learned. So just really briefly to go over the background of the project to give you an idea of the data. Um, this was a part of the Integrating a Neonatal Healthcare Package for Malawi. So at this point of time, um, when this project was going on, uh, there was a lot of um, success in Malawi um, during the Millennium Development Goals in reducing under five child mortality rates, but there were still challenges in lowering the neonatal, neonatal mortality rates. So there are a number of evidence-based interventions to improve neonatal outcomes, but um, implementation is, a, is an extra level on that. So there is a need to understand the implementation factors. Um, and we were particularly interested in strengthening regional um, hospital care. So at the district levels, secondary level hospitals. Um, and we were really interested in innovative and locally appropriate interventions. 
So at the time of the project, the preterm birth rate in um, Malawi was among the highest in the world. It was 18%. And complications of prematurity around the world is the leading cause of neonatal deaths. And there's a significantly higher risk of developing re respiratory distress among preterm infants. So some of the interventions that we looked at was scaling up an innovative bubble CPAP system at tertiary and district hospitals in Malawi, which is actually very uh, kind of uh, at ahead of its time um, to be implementing these at district hospitals, um, but did come with a number of different, um, different implementation um, barriers and facilitators. Uh, and I'm mainly going, I, the data that we shared was mainly about bubble CPAP, um, but uh, we also looked at not just bubble CPAP, but the other, other interventions that were um, involved in strengthening neonatal care at district hospitals, which included lactation support, kangaroo mother care, infant warming devices, and um, LED phototherapy. So our project was based in southern um, Malawi. So you can see there in three regions, um, Palombe, Mulanje, and Chikwawa. And the data that uh, the data sets that we shared involved a facility assessment at the district hospitals, um, which is largely quantitative data, as well as barriers and facilitators to implementing bubble CPAP, which is a largely qualitative data set. Um, so this is a kind of mixed methods project, and both are observational data sets. So in the facility assessment um, involved a comprehensive facility assessment for newborn care using the WHO Integrated Quality of Care Assessment Tool. So unlike some of the other tools out there, it doesn't just do quantity and availability of care, but also um, includes observations on quality of care. And it used um, a series of structured checklists with each aspect of care observed um, by our data collectors and scored one from um, very low quality of care and not available at all to five meeting the standards of care. And the variables that we assessed were, um, we selected the, uh, the modules that were focused on neonatal care or would be involved in neonatal care. Um, and the variables uh, that we looked at included infrastructure, ward layout, staffing, emergency care, inpatient um, care, infection control, and supportive care, essential drugs, equipment and supplies, case management, monitoring and follow-up. There were over 600 questions that uh, in each of these facility assessments for each of the, um, for each of the district um, sites. So it's a very comprehensive data set. It's a very comprehensive assessment snapshot in time. And I'll talk about this a little bit later, but we had our use of it, but we also wanted it not, we felt like there was so much time and um, energy put into this that we also wanted um, it to be more available and, and used by others as well. Uh, and then the second component was um, the barriers and facilitators to bubble CPAP. And this involved 46 in-depth interviews um, with nurses, clinicians, and clinical supervisors. So this is kind of crazy if you think about it, because it's, it's over, like they were each about 30 to 60 minutes long and, and probably closer to the 60 minute side. So if you think about that, that's probably like 40 hours of interviews um, covering training, initiation, monitoring, differences in opinions, perspectives, personal experiences, and what they felt um, was parental understanding of bubble CPAP. And then all of this data was digitally recorded, transcribed verbatim, and uh, we thematically analyzed it. So that just gives you a bit of background on the data itself. And so why did we choose to do data sharing? Well, our MG team um, is brilliant, in my opinion, <laughs> which of course I'm biased, but um, we only have so much capacity to work through this data. Other people may have other questions and ideas that we can't think of or have time to explore. And this is especially true in resource constrained settings or vulnerable populations to reduce the need to conduct this um, research again. Um, sharing our data sets can support other researchers uh, conducting 
um, similar implementation research into barriers and facilitators for scaling up innovative technologies in resource-constrained global health settings. Um, it can be a baseline for other projects. Um, so uh, there is, in Malawi, there is a big project or initiative to strengthen newborn care at, um, at uh, district hospitals. And, and in our conversations, they talked about how they didn't have good baseline data. And we're like, oh, actually, you know what? We, we've done these facility assessments that you can use if you want to, um, as well as we also have these qualitative data set. You can understand even some of the more um, intangible comments about uh, human resources and things like that. And then also there's a part of it that, that we had a commitment to share this data with the district hospital management teams for their own health strengthening um, initiative, health system strengthening initiatives. So this provided a standardized way that they can access it. Um, and also sharing our tool supports other researchers conducting implementation um, research. So we shared our interview guide, we shared the tools that we used. Um, and I just really want to emphasize that sometimes we ask very similar questions. And there is the importance of doing this research in low resource settings. But every time we do this research, uh, it can, it, you're already, you're burdening already a, a low resource setting. So if we can share this research, hopefully maybe we could do some of the exploratory um, investigations or, or um, looking at things that we might want to explore uh, or pilot studying kind of uh, things like that with open data sets. Um, we also had a few students work on this project with this data set and may, making this data set open. Um, other trainees might also be able to work on it when it otherwise might not be feasible for them to do their own research. So in summary, open data for us was important because it helps to conceptualize the research as a part of a wider conversation in a given field. And I think as Trin said, it, it helps to promote access and um, accountability and also really supports building momentum um, for the topics that we're so passionate about um, and building collaboration. So very quickly, I wanted to talk a little bit about the IDRC Open Data Research Initiative that this project was um, a part of. And it was a this was a sub-grant to support IDRC projects to share their data. Um, and it was really great because it involved um, some salary support for a staff member um, to spend the time to do this. As Fran was saying, it does take time to um, clean the data and consider all the different parts of it. Um, it involves some training workshops, um, as well as support and coaching for the data management plan, depositing and um, writing up a, a data descriptor article. And one of the things that I learned through this process was it was, they used a very pragmatic approach. Um, and versus maybe a purist approach the, of the ideals of open data. Um, and it acknowledges that not all data can or should be openly shared. Um, and it invites you to really consider what types of data are in your research and what you would want to share from it. Um, and to really look carefully at your team capacity for management and sustainability. Um, and I, for me, the most confusing part was licensing. And, it talked, we talked a little bit about the limits of licensing as well. Um, so I have a picture here of a cat in a bag because um, one of the things about open data is you have to be, you have to be very thoughtful about what data you want to share because once, once it's out there, once the cat's out of the bag, so to say, um, it's really hard to put back in. So uh, you can say, okay, I only want these people use the data um, and to use it for this reason. But once it gets out there, your ability to control that might be limited. And so with licensing, you can put all different types of licensing. But if you put a more restrictive licensing, one of the challenges is enforcing that. And uh, for us as a small project, we had to be really thoughtful um, on what data we wanted to actually put out there. So sometimes this can be, I think, I really like what Shren said about openish data, um, uh, but still contributing 
um, to kind of the scientific community. So the process of making our data open in this project. So first, um, we went through a data management plan, um, and this doesn't even need to be for data, open data sharing, but can be for all data. Um, and it's a structured plan describing how you'll manage, capture, process, and share data in your work. And in this, um, you consider kind of the types of data that you want to use um, and, and share, uh, documentation of your research data. So how did you um, come to this research? Or like, how did you get this data? What was the objectives of it? Um, the technical infrastructure that we're going to use, the security of managing that data, and, and what's our approach to data sharing, um, as well as backup and data preservation, and who's going to be the stewards of this. So the roles and responsibilities around both processing the data to in preparation for open data, and then stewarding the um, stewarding the, the data access once it's out there. Um, and I have a uh, um, a QR code here if you want to look at ours for this project. Um, and this is a, a site that we use, the DMP online, which um, has a structured um, plan that um, helps us kind of think through everything. Also in this part, um, it's really important to um, look into the ethics and consent as was previously discussed as well. Um, so, the next part for us was preparing our data sets. And for this, we really considered what would be useful to others. And we we talked with a number of different stakeholders on, on this part here, including other projects in Malawi. Um, and what were we willing to share? So a huge part for us is maintaining confidentiality. So um, the definition of say, uh, sensitive data includes both a direct identifiers and a combination of indirect identifiers. So this presents a challenge in qualitative work because through the transcripts, maybe you can take out names, but they might be able to piece together things from other ways of describing um, their context. So for us, we decided that audio files and transcripts were not part of our data set because it was just, we couldn't maintain confidentiality in that way. And even if we thought that we could identify everything, um, maybe we don't see something that someone else may be, may be able to put together. And we did, um, uh, in our process of consenting our participants, we did um, strive to uh, ensure confidentiality, especially as they're talking about um, unfavorable, sometimes unfavorable situations in their work um, settings. So, the qualitative data set that we shared included illustrative quotes by variable. So we presented a matrix of staffing and um, uh, training and staffing quotes, initiation, monitoring, weaning, caregivers and supplies and equipment. And then the dimension of some of these data sets was by facility type and health worker cadre. Um, and each of the quotes uh, included detail on sex and respondent uh, and their age. So someone else may have a different research question and they will be able to kind of look it up using um, the matrix that we've provided. And then the hospitals are numbered rather than named. Um, of course, when we shared it to the district hospitals, we, we let them know what number their district was. Um, and we had a, a consistent numbering between the qualitative and quantitative data sets. So it can be linked by other researchers. So I just wanted to give a snapshot here. Um, of course, this is open, openly accessed, so you can actually access these data. Um, but this is the facility assessment. So you can kind of see um, uh, what we reported and how we reported it. And this, this is our uh, qualitative data set. So you can see that we had um, the descriptors, um, the number of interviews I can mention it. This, uh, various and facilitators and um, different quotes. And it, it continues down by cadre and things like that. Um, so Shrin briefly talked about this as well. Um, so the next step for us was depositing in an open data repository and uh, we chose Figshare, um, but overall a good repository is one that assigns you a persistent identifier, so DOI and displays it for you. 
allows you to link um, your resources, includes a term of use or reference, uh, provides um, information um, for the reader on your data. Uh, so uh, a metadata landing page and uses a standard access protocol. So that's HTTP, which um, we don't think about as much, but um, is also important. Um, and just really quickly, uh, and we could talk about this more later if anyone has any questions on it, but just a really important of having rich meta metadata. So um, the people who might wanna use this data can understand um, how this data was generated, um, why were they generated, so they can understand the, um, the, the approaches that you took and if it works with the study that they're trying to work on. And really quickly on data usage licensing, um, this again uh, was the most confusing part for me. Uh, the most, um, the one that people prefer, data like open access um, prefers is Creative Commons Zero, which is no rights reserved. Um, uh, but it tends to not be as good for broader work. Um, so attribution a CCBY um, is recommended for broader data items, including figures, media, posters, papers, file sets, etc. cetera. Um, and it allows people to use your data, um, even commercially, um, but they have to credit it to you. And then attribution non-commercial is similar to CCBY, but it's non-commercial use only. Um, again, there's these I found were the most popular and the ones that we were considering. Um, we ended up going with CCBY um, because we had broader data items um, and we didn't have the capacity to reinforce or like to enforce non-commercial if that was something that we um, we were concerned about. Um, and lastly, we did a data descriptor article. Um, so we published this to BMC research notes. And um, data descriptor articles are peer reviewed publications dedicated to describing data sets. So it doesn't have any results, but rather linked to publicly available data sets and provides detail to facilitate their use. Um, and what's great about this is it's a much more searchable than navigating the numerous repositories. So just uh, finishing us off here on lessons learned. For us, we learned that really, it really takes time. It needs dedicated staff hours to navigate the process, to clean, do all the steps, um, to post it. Um, and that the data descriptions are really important for reusability. You can just put your data out there, but if you don't describe it, then it's really hard for someone else to consider it um, for their own research. Uh, for it, it was possible to share a qualitative data set, um, but it did take a little bit of reflection um, on our part on what we were comfortable in sharing and, and, and what we felt would be the most useful for other researchers. And for us, it was really important for us to take a pragmatic approach um, to, uh, to really reflect on the level of open data we were comfortable with. And then um, it was really important for us um, to share our data to support transparency, reproducibility, um, and data commitments to our stakeholders, funders, and scientific communities. And I just wanted to end um, here to talk a little bit about Indigenous data governance as well. So I think that there's lots of OCAP principles um, where uh, this may seem um, uh, in conflict to data sharing, but for us, uh, I don't know if it necessarily means that data sharing is impossible, but it really emphasizes the importance of um, data, uh, data management plan, good communication with stakeholders and a pragmatic approach, um, and really kind of uh, taking a sense of humbleness to the research um, and prioritizing indigenous data governance. Uh, so one of our current projects it means that we will prepare our data sets um, and descriptors like we did for an open data repository, um, but instead we'll provide this to First Nations Health Authority after the project is steward. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Any questions? So I guess I'll stop sharing here.
Yeah. Thanks, Maggie. That was excellent. Um, I see Beth has dropped a, a question for you in the chat. Uh, let me you and, and Shrin, if you want to comment some more. Um, uh, yeah, okay. So Shrin Maggie mentioned that making data open um, is not the same as equitable. So what additional steps um, are needed to use open data as a method to reach equity in data access and use? Um, how did your team consider this? Yeah, I think that that is a really good question. And sometimes we think, okay, if we just put it online, then, then it's out there. <laughs> but I think there's a really uh, important emphasis on um, searchability. Uh, so for us, it was publishing that data access, a uh, data descriptor article, which would make it more searchable. Um, and really describing our data set. Um, so like a lot of uh, the process of making data open for us included uh, very detailed descriptions of our methods and our objectives and things like that. So other people can, if they want to use it, um, then they would, uh, then they would understand how the data came to be and could understand it. Um, I hope that answers your question. Shrin, maybe if you wanted to um, jump in on that or follow sure, up like, on the I, other question. Like, like speaking on the on the equity idea, it's it's not straightforward um, and it's not easy to solve per se. Um, like I think there are things that people can do, um, whether it's preferential access to folks in various parts of the world. Um, or sort of direct capacity building for the analytic processes that would be required to access the data um, and all those other approaches that could um, sort of move a needle towards better equitable approaches to data. Um, but if you're going to make your data open, um, some parts of the world will use it more than others, inevitably. Yeah, so having some support for young investigators or investigators of certain um, geographic regions so that they can make use of the data when it's there. Yeah, a little bit. And this is why I use the term open-ish data rather than fully open data. Because um, in a way, putting some guardrails and putting some um, approaches that focus on the, the goals at hand, whether, if the goal is purely reproducibility, um, then maybe there's benefit in having the best scientists in the world at the best institutions evaluate it. But if the goal is something bigger and broader than that, which is sort of building trust, building community, and sort of um, really engaging folks around the world, then I think we can do things slightly differently. I, I mean, I think that was one of the valuable things from our research was that we were able to have students work on it, whereas maybe for a master's program or even um, a medical um, um, elective, they don't have time to go out and, or um, to collect some of this data, but they have, you can kind of mentor them to do different research questions and they can use the data sets and come up with their own research questions, projects and methods and, and analysis. And, and we've actually had a few students um, both in Canada and in Malawi, use this data set and, and publish from it. Mark put a question in the chat as well. For our institution, what should be the minimum standard for anonymization? Does anyone want to take a stab at that? <laughs> Mark, is that a technical question about the degree of anonymization or a um, policy question, more of a should we offer anonymization services to everybody? Yeah, Shun, I think it's really the fact that most investigators don't know what this means. Yeah. And having been guilty of that myself, of you know, removing a few names and direct identifiers, think you've anonymized a data set. I think it's a huge issue that we as institution need to be able to deal with. I think it depends on the type of data as well. So I think Shrin and I both talked about a number of different types of data. 
Um, and it might be, I don't know if there's a straightforward answer to that um, because it might be different for different data sets. For a qualitative data set, we didn't share the transcripts because there was no way we could, um, if we shared the, the full transcripts that we would be able to guarantee confidentiality, not even a nominee, <laughs> anonymization. So um, for that, we selected to make a matrix um, because that was what we were more comfortable with, with sharing. So maybe with clinical data, uh, like a, like a, from a clinical trial, you may be able to, to anonymize it more. Once again, I think it speaks to the importance of having some institutional um, standards here, and it shouldn't be on our sort of definitions. It should have sort of very clear educational sessions and standards at the at high levels about what we do and mean by anonymization. I think um, it's important to consider some of the priorities as well with open data and 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 why we're sharing it and and kind of take a very humble approach to it as well. So uh, to think about um, the risks to participants. Um, and, and I think that like, if we can't confident, like if we're not confident in being able to protect their identity, which is something that we've committed to, then um, that should take the priority as well as with indigenous data governance, um, that should also take the priority as well. So, um, but that doesn't mean to say that data sharing is impossible. I think it's just really being reflexive and taking a humble approach to this process and open communication with all stakeholders. All right, are there, oh, I think one last question here. I'm just about at the top of the hour. So I think this will be perhaps the last one. Um, so when you share your data, do you give us authorship? How do you ensure you stay a collaborator? That's a great question. Oh, I can answer this one actually, unless Sharon wants to jump in. No, Maggie, tell you. <laughs> licensing. So this is, uh, this is that confusing question about licensing. So if you do zero, um, that's no rights reserved. They can, um, uh, attribute you or they cannot attribute you. Um, and then CCBY and the other forms, they're supposed to um, uh, reference you and your data set. I mean, if they're publishing it, people are gonna wonder where their data is coming from. Um, so there is some sort of trace on that, but uh, there's different methods. Um, so some ways you can control who you're giving it out to, uh, but that is going to be more intense stewardship, and it depends on the capacity of your team and the sustainability of that. Are you always going to have a data steward working on this project? And what if like team members come and go and things like that? So you could just put it onto an open data repository, but then you have very little control about exactly what they're going to do with it. So um, again, for me, for our approach, it kind of goes back to what you're comfortable with. And being really reflective on that. Excellent. Okay, so I guess we're at the end of the session today, um, out of time, but that was a really excellent um, workshop. I really appreciate Maggie and, and Shrin for joining us today for presenting and for Beth for, for um, hosting today. Anybody um, on the call today, we'd love for you to complete our survey on the workshop. We'd love to host more workshops on open data. And so you can help us improve our workshop series and also weigh in on, on potential open data topics for our, our next workshop. So thanks everybody for joining and I hope you have a great day.